To understand why brumination has such wonderful selectivity for tertiary positions, we need to look at the mechanism and look at all four of those halogens to learn something about energetics and see why brumination itself is particularly special. Let's just draw out the mechanism quickly and we'll assume that we're looking at a secondary carbon. And we have to say which one it is because the bond strengths vary a little bit depending on whether you're looking at methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. But just as an example, let's call it secondary because that's sort of in the middle. And so what we're really looking at is something that would be like this, R2C, H2. And for the mechanism itself, we can neglect looking at the initiation step and the termination step because those happen very infrequently and they are not involved in the selectivity at all. So in terms of energetics, they are minuscule. And in terms of selectivity, they are totally irrelevant. So the first of the propagation steps is a step where we have a carbon-hydrogen plus a radical. And that forms a new bond between the halogen and hydrogen and makes a carbon radical. In the second propagation step, We've got halogen plus the carbon radical, and that makes a new bond while it's breaking the halogen-halogen bond. So now we make a halogen radical plus CX. And recall for these two steps, the delta H is equal to the bond strengths, the bond associated energies for the bonds that we're breaking. So it's this the CH bond association energy minus what we make, the HX bond association energy. And for the second step, the same thing is true. We have one bond that we're breaking and one bond that we're making. And so it's going to cost us the XX bond association energy. And it's going to gain us the CX bond association energy. Now take a look at these values for the various halogens. If X is fluorine, this first step, the value is minus 171, and that's kilojoules per mole. And remember, a negative number is, evolves energy. So this step is major exothermic. And in the second step, it's minus 280. And overall, for fluorine, if I've got my math right, it's minus 451 kilojoules per mole. This is why fluorination is not done normally through a radical process. Way too much heat is evolved to control the sky. This is a lot of heat for step one, and step two is even much more. So it's highly exothermic. Let's look at the numbers for Cl. Minus 34. That's exothermic, but manageable. It's not minus 171. And minus 97. So this is exothermic too. And we will have to worry about the heat. But the heat evolved is far, far less than for fluorination. For bromination, these numbers are plus 31. This is uphill, this first step. That's very important. We'll get back to that. And minus 92. So for bromination, overall it's a little exothermic, which is good. That means that it will happen. And if iodination were to happen, the numbers are plus 100. This is huge. Big energy barrier to that first step. And then in the second step, you get some of it back, but not all of it. So the bottom line here is that fluorination isn't done normally because it's so exothermic. And iodination isn't done because it doesn't happen. It's uphill. So radical chlorination and radical bromination happen because they're energetically manageable. But recall that there's a substantial difference between the synthetic outcome of these, where bromination is highly selective for tertiary position, and chlorination is not. Chlorination prefers reaction at tertiary positions, but not by a lot. And we ought to take a look at that just to see if we can understand it. Notice that the step that determines selectivity is that first step. But we need to focus on that. And that step, when we look carefully at it, has the following happening. It has bond breaking between CH happening and bond making between H and X happening simultaneously. There's a transition state. 
Now, we don't know how much bond breaking and how much bond making there is in this transition state, but Hammond's postulate lets us guess. You remember that his postulate says that the transition state will look most like either the reactants or what's being formed, depending on what it's closest to in energy. So let's look at the energy diagram for these guys. And let's look at these two cases. When we're talking about chlorine, notice that this step is exothermic. So we're starting someplace and we're ending downhill. And for bromination, let's say energetically we set the start to be the same, but we're finishing uphill. What does that tell us about what the structure of the transition state? For the exothermic reaction, this transition state is closer in energy to what we start with. And for the bromination, this set of reactants is further away. So the transition state structure looks more like product. That product is where the radical is. For chlorination, for emphasis, I'll exaggerate, it looks more like what we start with and we haven't formed much of the radical yet. Let me make that CL just to be clear. And for bromination, this bond is much more broken and we've come a lot closer to forming the HX bond. So in this case, we've come a lot closer to fully forming the radical. And whether there is one R group or two R groups or three R groups attached to that carbon makes a bigger difference because radicals are stabilized by alkyl groups. And for chlorination, when we have very little radical character, the number of alkyl groups doesn't matter much. So Hammond's postulate lets us guess what the structure of the transition state is. And that lets us explain the facts that are observed. That chlorination is not very selective and bromination is much more selective. Hammond's postulate, a very powerful tool.